Hello, I'm Bobby Jean Schweitzer, and I will be presenting on Gastrointestinal and Hepatic Systems, Part 3. This lecture module will consist of gastrointestinal reflux disease and aspiration risk, diseases of the biliary tract and pancreas, and inflammatory bowel disease. Let's start with gastrointestinal reflux disease and aspiration risk. And the first question is, you are awakened at 5 a.m. while you are on call for a patient who needs exploration of a stab wound to his upper arm. The patient has not eaten since 5 p.m. the day before, is healthy except for a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, better known as GERD, and a quote-unquote difficult airway. A, an endotracheal tube, ET tube is necessary, B, rapid sequence indication, induction is indicated. C, if the patient requires a fiber optic intubation, it should be done awake. Or D, laryngeal mask airway is an option. And the answer is laryngeal mask airway is an option. So the answer D is correct because the history of GERD alone has not been consistently associated with a risk of aspiration especially if asymptomatic on medications. Answer A is incorrect because not all patients with GERD are at risk of aspiration. Answer B is incorrect because a sleep fiber optic is an option in patients without symptoms of GERD if they are considered low risk for aspiration otherwise. And answer D is incorrect because laryngeal mask airways have been used safely in patients with a history of GERD. So what is gastroesophageal reflux disease? Or gastroesophageal reflux is the retrograde movement of gastric contents through the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. Aspiration is the movement of these contents past the upper esophageal sphincter and the pharynx actually into the lungs. Heartburn is the most common symptom of reflux and about 20% of the population complains of heartburn at least once a week, and about 4 to 10% complain of heartburn daily. Other symptoms include chest pain, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, pharyngitis, cough, asthma, hoarseness, laryngitis, and sinusitis. So reflux risk factors include having an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, and when the lower esophageal sphincter pressure is less than the intra-abdominal or intra-gastric intra gastric pressure with esophageal dysmotility and in the presence of a hiatal hernia. GERD is associated with pregnancy, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, gastric outlet obstruction, gastric neuropathy such as gastroparesis which typically occurs in diabetics, and increase intra-abdominal pressure from things such as cystitis, tumor, or significant obesity. The pictorial there shows the um, esophagus um, and the lower esophageal sphincter, which is typically situated below the level of the diaphragm, but sometimes can be above that in the presence of a hiatal hernia. Um, and the opening of the lower esophageal sphincter allows um, uh, fluid from the stomach to uh, reflux back into the esophagus. Let's do another question. As you drag yourself out of bed to go see your stab wound patient, you try to remember what you want to ask him about his GERD. Which symptom is not commonly associated with GERD? A, cough, B, chest pain, C, abdominal pain, D, hoarseness, or E, laryngitis? Which of these is not associated? Typically, abdominal pain is not commonly associated with GERD. Um, answer A is incorrect because cough can be a result of reflux. Answer B is incorrect because chest pain um, also can be due to reflux, um, primarily from uh, esophageal spasms um, from, uh, from the acid. And answer D is incorrect because hoarseness due to chronic inflammation and irritation of the vocal cords occurs with chronic reflux. And answer E is incorrect because laryngitis can result from inflammation or irritation of the vocal cords. So the risk of aspiration with GERD um, or with risk factors for GERD is 
not well established in spite of kind of uh, popular misunderstandings. Um, but if you are concerned that your patient has an increased aspiration, um, administering prokinetics um, such as metoclopramide can help empty the stomach, reduce its contents, and therefore reduce uh, the amount of contents that is available for uh, reflux. Um, uh, medical bromide does is associated with certain experimental effects and cardioathetosis, uh, particularly if given in large doses or given rapidly. H2 receptor blockers can decrease gastric acid secretion, but they may also decrease lower esophageal sphincter uh, pressure. Um, H2 receptor blockers can be associated, not commonly, but can be associated with confusion, agitation, and psychosis, especially in elderly patients. Uh, proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, um, decrease gastric acid secretion. So the decision to perform rapid sequence induction um, needs to balance the risk of aspiration and the risk of airway management. And this is actually quite controversial. Uh, the use of medications to lower acidity and volume are typically not controversial. Um, so one should always consider, if one is concerned about aspiration, um, the use of metoclopramide, H2 blockers, PPIs, and sodium bicarbonate or bicitra um, to both reduce the contents in the stomach as well as the acid of the contents. Particular antacids such as mylanta, my, malox, um, and the such actually worsen aspiration pneumonitis and should not be used. Cricoid pressure is used to obstruct potential flow of gastric contents into the pharynx and the trachea. Cricoid pressure is not completely benign. Um, it may actually worsen visualization of the airway and make it more difficult to intubate a patient. Um, it is, can cause laryngeal obstruction and trauma. It can cause displacement of an unstable cervical spine. Um, there have been uh, rare but reported events of esophageal rupture in patients who did vomit or reflux um, and were, were being given cricoid pressure. It may worsen reflux by actually lowering lower esophageal sphincter uh, tone. Um, and the complications of cricoid are more common in the elderly, in children, in pregnant patients, those with cervical spine injuries, and those where there's difficulty in palpating and identifying the thyroid, or, I mean, sorry, the cricoid cartilage. So another question, as you splash water on your face in the call room to try to wake up, you try to remember which of the surgeons told you the patient, uh, when the surgeon told you the patient last ate. And which of the following has been proven to lower the risk of aspiration? A, applying cricoid pressure. B, doing a rapid sequence induction. C, doing a sleep fiber optic intubation. Or D, having the patient fast for 24 hours. And the answer is, is having the patient fast for 24 hours. This may be more than necessary in some patients, um, but in other patients may not be. Uh, answer D is correct because fasting does lower the risk of aspiration, and that has been uh, shown in the literature. How long one must fast, though, however, is unknown. For some patients with gastroparesis um, or esophageal dysmotility or achalasia or acute abdominal processes, it may actually take more than 24 hours to ensure an empty stomach. Answer A is incorrect because whether cricoid pressure reduces aspiration or not is actually controversial. Cricoid pressure alters the esophageal sphincter tone and can make intubation more difficult, as we have described earlier. Answer B is incorrect because even though uh, rapid sequence induction has become the standard of care to reduce aspiration, there is actually no evidence to support that it is effective. And answer C is incorrect because sedation and general aspiration um, removes the patient's ability, or general anesthesia, excuse me, removes the patient's ability to protect their airway. So let's talk about diseases of the biliary tract and the pancreas. Here's another question. A 44-year-old obese female with common bile duct stone for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy presents. Which drug may worsen her symptoms and outcome of the procedure? A, amiprazole, B, midazolam, C, metoclopramide, D, fentanyl, or E, lidocaine? And the clue may be in the pictorial. And the answer is fentanyl. And it's because the effect it has on the sphincter of OD. 
So the um, answer D is correct because opioids can cause spasm of the sphincter of OD and interfere with performance of interoperative cholangiograms and detection of, of biliary duct stones. Answers A, B, C, and E are incorrect because these drugs do not cause spasm of the sphincter of OD. So diseases of the biliary tract uh, consist of uh, tumors, um, which often present with painless jaundice, gallstones, which often present with painful jaundice or pain without jaundice. Gallstones are present in about 10% of men and about 20% of women um, aged 55 to 65. Um, acute gallstones uh, can cause elevated bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase levels. The rest of the liver function tests are typically normal, however. Cholidocolithiasis is the presence of common bile duct stones or stones in the common bile duct rather than just simply the gallbladder. Cholecystitis is a term used to describe inflammation or infection of the gallbladder. And in this condition, typically you also have elevated bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase levels, though the rest of the LFTs are typically normal. So let's talk a little bit about laboratory tests for diseases of the biliary tract. Um, patients typically have elevated bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase, as we've mentioned, um, but the rest of the uh, liver function tests, the transaminases, um, are normal. Obstruction of the bile duct uh, typically results in jaundice unless relieved um, uh, expeditiously. Um, disruption of biliary circulation can result in vitamin K deficiency. Hepatocytes, uh, however, continue to make procoagulants. Uh, but they just can't carboxylate them. Uh, parenteral vitamin K should correct any coagulopathy of cholestasis as long as the liver um, itself does not have um, uh, disease. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the perioperative management of patients scheduled for a removal of their gallbladder. Um, patients who are acutely symptomatic with acute abdominal pain um, and often associated with nausea and vomiting, are considered at increased risk for aspiration, um, regardless of their fasting period. Remember, opioids may cause a spasm of the sphincter of OD. This can both worsen abdominal pain preoperatively before induction of anesthesia, but can also interfere with interoperative cholangiogram um, or detection of common bile duct stones. So what is an interoperative cholangiogram? Well, it's a... a in, um, in, introduction of dye into the biliary tract to detect any obstruction um, either related to uh, scarring, stones, or tumors. Um, and it um, also can be used for to detect injury of the common bile duct that could have occurred during an, either an ERCP or a surgical procedure. Uh, common bile duct injuries are more common with inexperienced surgeons performing laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the pancreas. The pancreas is an organ that sits um, high in the uh, upper abdomen in the retroperitoneal space. Um, disease, pancreatitis um, and pancreatic cancer are the two most common uh, disorders of the pancreas. Pancreatitis is caused in, and complicated um, by pseudocysts, abscesses, and gallstones, and patients may be very, very acutely ill with pancreatitis. Pancreatic cancer is typically treated with Whipple procedures, which can be very, very lengthy procedures. Um, uh, treatment of pancreatic disease can be either laparoscopically or through open laparotomies. Um, generally, uh, they are done with a general anesthetic, um, but this may be combined with an epidural as well. Um, the usual sort of, you know, typical IV access, and often with more than one or large bore IV is, is necessary. Um, routine monitors, of course, um, routinely for major uh, pancreatic uh, procedures or for very ill patients, arterial lines are used and often central lines or CVP catheters are used as well. Um, there's some non-surgical interventions for pancreatic or biliary disease. These are generally uh, administered by gastroenterologists and administered in non-operating room settings, but uh, typically do require anesthesia services. So the most common one is, is, is an ERCP, which is an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Um, this combines both endoscopy and fluoroscopy or, or uh, radiologic imaging. Um, it's used for the evaluation and or treatment of gallstones, obstructive jaundice, pancreatic masses, um, or uh, biliary tract um, or bile duct injuries. Um, it can be uh, 
per, uh, ERCP can be done with either deep monitored anesthesia care or general anesthesia. The patient is typically positioned, as you see in this picture, in what is considered a prone or sloppy prone position. One often has limited access to the airway, both because of the uh, gastroenterologist placing scopes uh, through the um, mouth, as well as the table positioning, and then the patient positioned on the table. Um, and they can be quite lengthy. Let's talk a bit about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and we'll start with a question as usual. You are evaluating a complicated patient with long-standing inflammatory bowel disease for a colectomy. Which organ is never directly affected by IBD? A, the large intestine, B, the pancreas, C, the mouth, or D, the small intestine? Which organ is not affected? And it's the pancreas. So answer B is, is correct because neither Crohn's nor ulcerative colitis affect the pancreas. Answer A is incorrect because both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can affect the large intestine. Answer C is incorrect because Crohn's can affect the entire gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. And answer D is incorrect because Crohn's affects the small intestine, but ulcerative colitis does not. So inflammatory bowel disease is caused by an abnormal response of the bowel mucosal immune system to normal bowel, normal bowel flora, or at least that's the um, current um, going diagnosis and explanation. Ulcerative colitis, as we mentioned, is restricted to the large intestine, and it, there's inflammation and loss of colonic mucosa. Crohn's disease, however, can affect any part of the GI tract, um, from the mouth to the anus, and it may cause transmural inflammation and perforation of the bowel, um, and abscesses and granulomatous disease are, are common. So IBD can be familial. The highest incidence is in Caucasians. Crohn's is higher in patients of Jewish descent. Risk factors for inflammatory bowel disease include smoking, having a previous appendectomy, taking um, multiple and uh, recurrent antibiotics, uh, being on oral contraceptive pills, and taking um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Symptoms include chronic abdominal pain, diarrhea, fever, or bloody stools. Complications include fistulas, bowel obstruction, strictures, and toxic megacolon. And cancer can occur in patients who have ulcerative colitis. And so those patients may actually be undergoing colectomies for prevention of colon cancer, treatment of their IBD, or treatment of colon cancer. Um, uh, IBD is typically managed with chronic medications. These include antidiarrheal medications, anti-inflammatory agents, antibiotics, anti-tumor necrosis factor or TNF agents, immunosuppressants, um, and investigational drugs. Preoperative steroids uh, are commonly used and should be continued. Um, there is a risk of adrenal suppression with long-term steroid use, and it may require perioperative uh, supplementation. There's no specific anesthetic regimen that's preferred. Cyclosporine does increase the MAC of volatile agents. Azathioprine may antagonize neuromuscular blocking agents. And cyclosporine and infliximab may enhance neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, in patients who have intestinal obstruction, um, it's important to assess their intravascular volume, as these patients may have had a long-standing chronic diarrhea and then complicated by nausea and vomiting um, and poor o uh, PO intake. Um, electrolyte uh, uh, concentrations should be assessed and managed and corrected whenever possible. These patients are considered full stomach um, and need all the precautions associated with that. If the patients have been vomiting, they may have a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, and of course, their nutritional status may be compromised. Total parenteral nutrition um, is um, common in patients who have uh, GI issues, particularly uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Hypoglycemia is a, likely to occur if one abruptly uh, discontinues total parenteral nutrition, um, so it's best to actually continue TPN at the usual um, infusion rates during the anesthetic course, if at all possible. If for some reason that is not possible, or the one runs out of the TPN solution, um, then one should administer D10. 
it's uh, generally not sufficient to just apply D5. Thank you very much for your time and attention.